Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today our special guest is not just one of the greatest and most beloved actors of our time. He's truly a member of Hollywood royalty. In a long and distinguished career spanning over 70 years, he starred in over 100 movies, including Titanic, A Kiss Before Dying, In Love and War, The Longest Day, The Towering Inferno, Curse of the Pink Panther, and three Austin Power movies. And of course, we all remember him from his two blockbuster TV series, It Takes a Thief and Heart to Heart. He's also guest starred in over 150 TV shows, most recently in NCIS as Anthony Denozo Sr. He's won a People's Choice Award and been nominated for six Golden Globe Awards. And in 2018, he won the Burton Moss Hollywood Golden Era Award. And if that weren't enough, he's also written three best-selling books, Pieces of My Heart, A Life, You Must Remember This, Life and Style in Hollywood's Golden Age, and I Loved Her in the Movie, Memories of Hollywood's Legendary Actresses. I'm overjoyed and deeply honored to welcome the incomparable Robert Wagner to our show. Mr. Wagner, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, I've never had a better introduction in my entire career than that one. I thank you very much. <sighs> Mr. Wagner, I understand that your friends affectionately call you RJ. Would it be okay if I call you RJ? Please do, Harvey, because I consider you a friend. <laughs> thank you so much. I must tell you that your body of work is so prolific that it's mind-boggling when I consider the movies and TV shows you made, the co-stars and directors you worked with, and the eras that you've lived through in Hollywood history. Do you sometimes look back at your life and wonder how you managed to accomplish as much as you did? Yes, I, I do, and I have. And, you know, Harvey, I, I must say I really live in gratitude because I've been so fortunate to meet so many wonderful people and my career has been so positive and I've had so many positive people around me. You know, it's, it's really been a gift for me and it's, it's been so wonderful and I, I just appreciate all of it. Your book, Pieces of My Heart, published in 2008, is a very candid and deeply personal account of your life and career. It really helped me understand where you came from and who you are, RJ. You grew up in Hollywood and you developed a passion for the movies very early on. How did that happen? Well, you know, we lived in a, a very, we had two theaters where we lived and I spent a lot of time there watching movies as a young kid. And I went to school with a lot of kids who were, who were kids of stars and directors and cameramen. And I just, uh, I, I love the movies. I, and I just was tr crazy about them. And my father belonged to a, a country club where there were movie stars. And I became a caddy there at that club. And I had the opportunity of meeting Ray Bolger and oh, Cary Grant and Clark Gable. I caddied for Clark Gable as a kid. And he, by the way, was just absolutely wonderful to me. He helped me a lot. Helped me uh, when, I, when he knew that I wanted to get started in the picture business, he got me lined up to go to MGM and meet some of the people, Billy Grady and people like that. And he was just a... He was a wonderful man. I admired him so much. And also Fred Astaire. I went to school with Fred Astaire's son. And I remember when I was uh, in the school, I, I was a boarder at the school. And on the weekends, we would go to families' homes and, and be there with them and play, you know, play with them on the weekends. And uh, Fred Astaire's son was a friend of mine. And I remember Fred Astaire picking me up and putting me in the car, in his car and his convertible and going to his home. He was a wonderful man, you know. And as you know, Harvey, I had the opportunity of working with him, you know, and it takes a thief. He played my, my father, uh, or rather I should say I played his son because he was the, he was the greatest thief of all. And 
I had a marvelous time working with him and he was so wonderful to me, so encouraging. You know, everybody was so encouraging to me uh, to help me get started. And I, you know, was very lucky. I got under contract to a studio when I was young. And that was the thing to, that was the most important thing at that time for young actors to become a contract player. And uh, I became a contract player at, at 20th Century Fox. And uh, Daryl Zanuck then started putting me in several different films. And I did a picture called With a Song in My Heart with Susan Hayward. She played Jane Froman. And that picture, I remember I said to, I said to Mr. Zanuck, I said, you know, I, I don't have very much to do in this film. I only have a few lines. And he said, uh, well, I, I think what will happen for you is that uh, people will walk out of the theater and say, who was that guy? And that's what happened. It's exactly what happened. Yes. And, and then, you know, the, the fans, the young fans started, you know, becoming interested in me. And I was, and then he started placing me in bigger pictures and bigger parts. And I was very fortunate. I was there for under contract to them for 12 years. You know, what a, what a, what a tremendous education I got from that. You can imagine Harvey. Oh, absolutely. You know, some people have said that you were a star even before you were an actor. Do you think it's true? Well, Natalie said that. I think that's who, who said that, my, my late wife. And she said that I was, she thought I was born a star. <laughs> <laughs> well, as you pointed out, in 1948, you were 18 years old. You signed your first studio contract at Fox. You wrote that as a young contract player, you were very anxious to find out why some people became stars and other people didn't. RJ, did you ever figure that out? No, <laughs> I never did. I, I, I don't know. It's just, you know, sometimes the magic works and sometimes it doesn't, Harvey. And I, I mean, I was placed in really good spots and had good people around me and they were watching out for me. And, you know, one thing led to another. And I was very fortunate, very fortunate. I had some wonderful people around me. Did you like the studio system as an actor? Yes, I did very much. And of course, as I said to you before, that was the thing to do at, when I started, you know, in 1948 was to become a contract player. And I had, you know, wonderful people at Fox. They were, oh, they all cared about me. And I had, carte blanche at the studio. I could go in the cutting rooms and in the, the, I, I could go anywhere and learn anything about the picture business. And I was so eager to do that. And it was such a wonderful, you know, ground for me to start on. I mean, it was a, ter a terrific break to be able to do that. And the people were all so wonderful to me. So what was the most important career advice that you ever received as a young actor? Oh, I had a lot of things said to me that helped me out very much, but I think, I think mostly was, you know, to listen and to, and to watch. And I had the opportunity of being able to watch a lot of marvelous actors be on the stage, on the sets and see them work. And I, I was the test boy at 20th Century Fox. So I had the opportunity of testing with a lot of, you know, beautiful young women and, and wonderful guys. And it was a, it was a school for me, Harvey, you know, I mean, it was, they, they, everybody was just, you know, so gracious and so kind to me and helped me out. And, and I was very appreciative of that, you know. You were directed by John Ford in What Price Glory. And you said, he scared the living hell out of you, but he taught you an important lesson about fame and holding on to your money. Did you take his advice? Uh, you know, uh, you know. Here, are, here I was at, you know, twenty-one. Tw yeah, I think I was twenty-one. I was doing What Price Glory, and I'm working for John Ford. Uh, I mean, I, I, it was the most wonderful 
moment for me in my life at that time. And he used to have, he had kind of picked on, on people and he, you know, he picked on me. I was the, the, the man in the barrel. And I remember he, he did a, I, I, I was in a scene with uh, Bill Demris and Dan Daly. And I remember I, I, I looked, I looked somewhere and he said, well, what are you doing? He said, cut, stop her. He said, what, he said, what are you doing? He said, you, you don't, you don't look, you don't look at something unless you're, you're told to do that. And I said, well, I read it in the script. He said, well, listen to me. You know, that's the important thing for you to do. And then he turned around and he knocked me down on the ground. And I had this pack on and helmet. And here I was lying on the ground looking up at John Ford, who had knocked me, knocked me down. I, I, if he'd have had the camera on me, I would have won the Academy Award. I, I was so surprised and, and so moved by him. And he, he was he he was he was a bit rough on me, you know, but John Wayne was there at that time and he put his arm around me. He said, just take it easy, kid. And, uh, you know, that's part of Mr. Ford's atmosphere. But, you know, John Ford was a marvelous director. You know, the man who co-authors on my books, he, he wrote the definitive book on John Ford, Scott Hyman. And uh, Scott was Scott is such a wonderful writer. He he's written so many wonderful things. I read his book on Louis B. Mayer, and I wanted. I, I was so impressed with his with his work, with his he made he made L. B. Mayer a human being, and I, I I just admired him so much. And this is this was a very lucky break for me. I was in Florida at a friend of ours home. I was with, we were with, with Ted Bell and I said, you know, Ted, I read this book and I like this author so much. And he said, I know him. And I said, could you introduce me to him? And he said, yeah. So we set up a meeting and we met in, uh, in Florida in a bar and I talked to Scott and we hit it off. And I said, would you be interested in writing a book for me? And he wrote pieces of my heart, you know, with me. and. The thing about it, Harvey, is that we became fast friends. We're, we're very, very close friends. And you can imagine, you know, to open up your past and your soul and your, your heart and to write a book with a person is, you know, you become very close, very, very close. And, and he's a wonderful man. And I, I we're out of all of the three books that we did together, he, he was, we became very, very close. Well, he did an amazing job in assisting you to bring out your life story and also your memories of Hollywood in all three of your books. And one of the fascinating things about you that comes through as a young man is that you were a contemporary of Marlon Brando and Montgomery Clift but you preferred to spend time with the older stars like Clark Gable, Spencer Tracy, Clifton Webb, David Niven. Why did you prefer the company of the older stars? Well, I, I think that just that just happened. I, I mean, I, I was so fortunate to be cast in Broken Lance with Spencer Tracy as his son. And I became very close to Spence, very close to him. As a matter of fact, I was one of the pallbearers at his funeral. And I don't know, I guess maybe it was the age, age difference. But I mean, I was thinking about when you asked me that question. Well, I think Marlon and I were probably the same age at that time. And uh, Jimmy Dean, he, you know, that, that was a big, big thing that happened in Hollywood. Changed the whole style of acting and all of that. And I think that I was fortunate enough to be able to to uh, be with David Niven. I mean, I, I love David. We were very close friends. And I'm, I'm still very close to his two sons, Jamie and David Niven Jr. And he, he was a marvelous man. And Cary Grant, you know, he Cary was so wonderful to me. And 
I guess it was because of my age. You know, I, I was a little bit older than those guys. Well, I think also you were so hungry to learn that you wanted to learn the secrets about how to be a great actor. I think you, I, I think you hit on that pretty well. You know, I, I, I really admired those men so much. And, you know, in the, in the book, I, I write about seeing that foursome come down the, the fairway and it's Cary Grant, Randolph Scott, Clark Gable and Fred Astaire. And, you know, uh, I knew all of them. I mean, what a what a great gift to be able to have a, a friendship with them. And Randolph Scott was wonderful to me. Just a wonderful man. They 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 were they were giants. Great great people. Great people. And you were also very close with Barbara Stanwyck, your co-star in Titanic. And you wrote that she had the most valuable thing that a performer could have: good taste. What did you mean by that, RJ? Well, you know, she she had the the ability to be able to recognize writing and writers and and being able to put herself into characters that were very outstanding, I thought. I mean, I thought she was just absolutely a marvelous actress and she was so great to me and I I loved her very much, and she was a wonderful person. Great, great to me. Absolutely fabulous. You know, I got the impression from your book, it wasn't just that she was a consummate professional. She had no ego. She taught you about acting and about reading and about art. I think she had a lot to do with giving you self-esteem. Yes, she did. There's no question about it. She gave me a great deal. And she was in my life and she really, she really cared for me. And I uh, appreciated that relationship more than you can imagine. At a time in life, which was so important. I mean, I was 24, 25 years old, you know, and she really settled me, settled me down, you know. Do you think she helped you cope with being famous? Because that was a big adjustment. Yes, I do. I do. She had a she had a marvelous attitude about her stardom. She was at one time the most highly paid woman in America. And she, you know, came from very very rough life. I mean, she came up from really her bootstraps and she was a very special and marvelous woman and wonderful actress. I mean, she gave us some great performances. That's for sure. In 1954, Photoplay magazine named you fastest rising star of the year. You were red hot as an actor. And then you made A Kiss Before Dying at the old Selznick studio where Gone with the Wind was filmed. Why do you think A Kiss Before Dying became such a huge cult classic? Well, you know, my sister read that in, I think it was McCall's magazine or something. It was a short story. And she said, you know, this would be a great part for you. And then so I took it to the studio and they developed it and they bought it. And I, it was a great character, you know, a wonderful character to play. And I had some great people in the picture with me. Gert Oswald directed it. And Mary Astor was uh, my mother. And Jeff Hunter was in it, and Virginia Leith, and the marvelous Joanne Woodward, who was one of her first pictures. And that character, I loved that character. That was a wonderful character to play, and a, and a surprise, you know, at that time. Very adventurous film to make at that time, you know. It was, and it's a real classic. Now, when you write about the movies that you made, you said that you remembered the relationships and the friendships you had with your co-stars even more than the actual movies themselves. It's almost as though you felt like you were part of a family when you were making movies. Is that how you felt on a film set? Yes, I did. And, you know, those film sets at that time, they were a family. We were all, you know, all, all together and caring for each other and, and loving each other. You know, Jill... 
my, my wife was under contract to Fox. And we, we, we often talk about that, about how it was family business and the pictures that you made, you became so friendly with the people that were there. And, and it's changed now. It's not the same. It, it, um, I mean, although I, I, I shouldn't say that really, because with my experience on, of being on NCIS, it's been like a family, you know, t- to me. I mean, Mark is a wonderful man and very special, very special person. And Michael Weatherly is great. And, you know, I mean, the, whole, the whole group is just marvelous. And I had a wonderful time being on that show. Now, at a certain point in your career, RJ, you developed stage fright and you wrote about it in your book. I just wondered if you have any advice for people on how to overcome it. You know, the, the, the most important thing I think you can have in life, whether you're an actor or, or not, is confidence and uh, in, your, in yourself and in feelings and in your personality and your beliefs. I got into that with hypnosis, and it helped me a great deal. Uh, I got this hypnotist that was just wonderful with me and settled me down. I was doing two pictures at the same time, and I was, you know, I I just was a little bit, I I lost it, you know, I, I, I lost it. And it's a terrible thing. I mean, it's a terrible thing to have stage fright. I mean, that is... That's brutal. And I worked my way through it. I got a little bit more, you know, confidence and kept going, putting one foot ahead of the other. And I, I think I think most people can have that happens to sometimes, you know, in relationships or in business or just socially, you know, you, you but I think if you stop and pull yourself back a little bit and start to look at yourself and try to ease yourself out of that, you know, ease yourself forward. Now, starting in 1968 with It Takes a Thief, you spent your career alternating between movies and TV. You had really the best of both worlds. You said that making television shows helped you a lot because you didn't have time to think. What did you mean by that, RJ? Well, you know, television is very, it's very quick. At least it was, was very quick. And I remember I went to, to Cary Grant. And, uh, you know, if, if, I mean, if you don't have the time, you're doing yourself. You know, you're not, you're not thinking about trying to be something else or be, be a different character in there. You, he said, why don't you use you? And <clears throat> you don't have to, you don't have to worry about it. Just be you. you he said, you, you're, you're, you got to, you're okay. Just do, do you. And I thought, well, that's pretty good. So I didn't have the time to think about being, being somebody else, you know? When I went, to, you know, when I when I went on a first casting session with uh, at Warner Brothers with a wonderful casting director called Sally Bayano, and I said, he said, "What do you do?" I said, "Oh, I, I can do Clark Gable for you, and Spencer Tracy, and I can do, you know, Jimmy Stewart. I do Jimmy Stewart." Uh, he said, "Well, we, we got all of those." He said, "What about doing you? Do you?" And he scared me. Very good advice. Yeah, very good. Very good for an actor, yeah. Now, RJ, a a lot of people don't know that you were offered the role of James Bond and you turned it down, and so Roger Moore got the role. You said that you felt too American to play a Brit. Have you ever regretted that decision? No, I never have. And uh, Cubby Broccoli was my agent. And as you know, Cubby Broccoli was the producer of the James Bond movies. And you know, I, I just said, Cubby, you know, I uh, I think Bond ought to be, you know, British, uh, British. And, and Roger was perfect. You know, he, he, Roger and I were very good friends. And uh, I just thought he I just thought he'd be a perfect Bond. And I thought he was. 
And here you are married to the first American Bond girl. Isn't that right? Right. <laughs> See what can happen? <laughs> and tomorrow, the 26th, is going to be our anniversary. Oh, happy anniversary. How many years, RJ? 32 years. 32 years of wedded bliss. And you're still crazy about each other. Yes, we are. Yeah, it's, it's been a wonderful thing for me. I, I never thought that I, I would ever find a person like Jill. And after Natalie passed away and died, I, I didn't know. I, I, I just I just had no idea what was, what was going to happen to me. And fortunately, Jill came into my life. And it's been wonderful, wonderful 32 years. Well, I wish you a very happy anniversary. And now I want to ask you about Betty Davis. You starred with her in Madame Sin in 1972. You became great friends until the day she died. In fact, our mutual friend, Catherine Cermak, facilitated this interview. I'm so grateful to her for doing that. You wrote about Betty Davis in your wonderful book, I Loved Her in the Movies. What can you tell us about what it was like to really work with Betty Davis? Well, you know, I, I knew her before. I, I had met her with Claire Trevor and her husband, Milton Brent. And I, I, had known, I had known Betty and been around her a little bit before any of that happened. And she, she liked, she thought I was very good in, in It Takes a Thief. And she came out and said that in a, um, a newspaper article that was in the New York Times, that I was a kind of the, the most wonderful young leading man and all of that. She was very complimentary. And I called her and I, I said, would you like to do our show? She wasn't working. You know, there was a period where she wasn't working. And she said, oh, I'd love to. So we wrote this character for her in It Takes a Thief. And she came out, and, I, and that's when I first worked with her. She was, you know, what professionally uh, that, that we were together. And she was such a special woman and such a special lady. And, and from there, I, we, we created Madame Sin. And I was fortunate enough to produce that picture and be in it. I wouldn't let anybody else be in it, <laughs> you know? Would I give that part to somebody else? I don't think so. And so we had a wonderful time doing that. And you mentioned Catherine Cermak. Catherine was so dedicated to her and was with her up until the last part of her life and do a lot of the wonderful things that she was able to do before she passed and left us. Wonderful lady. And I'm so glad that she was responsible for lining this interview up with you because this is really nice and I appreciate it very much. And it's so, you know, so wonderful to talk to and so easy. You, you make it so, so, so terribly easy for everyone. Oh, and, thank you, RJ. Oh, it's true. So, and anyway, with Betty, you know, she was such a special lady and she was so special to me. And, I had such fun with her. She was such a fun woman. And, you know, this, uh, she's this woman that's going to, that plays her in uh, an evening with Betty Davis, um, Morgana Shaw. She's wonderful. And it's a beautifully written script. I, I think it's going to be a wonderful night in the theater for everyone who has an opportunity to see it. Oh, absolutely. Now, can I tell you what I think your favorite role was that's my favorite of all the Robert Wagner roles you've played? Yeah, tell me. Well, in 1976, you made Cat on a Hot Tin Roof with Natalie Wood and Sir Lawrence Olivier. I thought that was just the top. Thank you so much. I loved doing that. You know, it was a wonderful cast, obviously, Lawrence Olivier, to work with him. And I became, we became very good friends, and Natalie and I, and and Lawrence Olivier, and and also, you know, Maureen Stapleton, was big mama. She was fabulous, 
and a wonderful actress. And to be able to work with her was, it was a real big pleasure. And uh, I, w- I was very friendly with her. We had great times together. Great. Well, in 1979, your TV show Heart to Heart went on the air and the show ran for five years. Is it true that the premise of the show was inspired by the Thin Man series starring William Powell and Myrna Loy as Nick and Nora Charles? Yes, it's true. Tom Mankiewicz, who is uh, no longer with us and who is my very dear friend, and Stephanie's and Jill's, he came to uh, Hawaii. Natalie had a three-picture situation with ABC for a pilot, for a series. And I said to Tom, he said, what do you want to do? I said, I want to, I would like to do something that I have the feeling when I watch The Thin Man. I, I like that, that, that premise. And I, and I like that kind of work. I thought that was very interesting. And he wrote it. He created Heart to Heart, really. He was also the, he, d- he directed the pilot. And he also was the man who, really produced it you know he was the creative consultant and I got Mark Crowley to uh, I asked him to come in and he came in and wrote a lot of material for Stephanie and myself and you know it it worked it it was a wonderful project for me I I just loved doing it and I loved all the people that were on it and we had a great time making it we made it in so many places we made it all over the world you know Well, I think the show really worked because of the on-screen chemistry between you and Stephanie Powers. And I read somewhere that casting her was your idea. Is that right? Yeah, it was Tom's and mine. Yeah. I had worked with Stephanie before. She worked with me uh, on a show that I did called Switch with Eddie Albert and uh, Sharon Gless. And I liked her very much. I thought she was just perfect. I thought she was just perfect for Jennifer Hart. And yes, she uh, really was. Yeah, she was a great, she was a great contributor to the show. Tremendous contributor. We had we had a great deal of fun making it and a great deal of joy. And you know, then we went on and did, you know, we we did a couple, we did about, I think we did eight movies, you know, after that. And I had a great time with her. She was terrific. Now, of course, you know, I have to ask you about Austin Powers, the trilogy, as I call it. Those movies all seemed so improvised and spontaneous, but I understand that they really were not, that it was all scripted. Uh, How did you make it look so ad-libbed? Well, we had a very good director for one reason. (laughs) And also Mike, you know, that came to me because I did uh, <clears throat> Saturday Night Live. And Mike was, you know, one of the writers and also one of the characters on the show. And he liked me. I liked him, too. We had a great fun. I, I did a, a two or three of his skits. And he wrote number two for me. And uh, that script hit the door. And I looked at it and I said, oh, my God, this is great. This is terrific. And uh it was all on the page. It was on the page. Uh, you couldn't, you know, they, we, we d- didn't ad lib, but I mean, maybe change a few things or a few, you know, with entrances and exits and stuff like that. But we, we really stayed on the, on, the, uh, on the page. But, you know, when I watched you in the Austin Power movies, you had such great instincts for comedy. Why didn't you do more comedies, RJ? I don't know. I, they just didn't come along. You know, I with the Panther, I had some comedy to do in there. And with Heart to Heart, we, we had a bit of comedy. But there was no comedy like Austin Powers. That was, a, <clears throat> that was really something. And in the last Austin Powers film, is it true that one of the scenes that was cut out had all of you in drag singing What's It All About, Alfie? Yes, that's true. It's amazing. Yeah, I wish they used it. It was funny. So if you had to say what was the most satisfying thing you've done in your career, would you be able to come up with with one thing? I don't know. I've had so many breaks. 
You know, it's been I've been I've been so fortunate. I mean, I love doing Heart to Heart. I like very much doing NCIS. I love doing the Panther. I, I you know, it. I, it's funny how things can change your career. And you know, when I, I did <clears throat> number two, I was in France in a little small town, and having lunch and I looked out the window and there was about 10 or 15 kids out there all going, you know, like that. <laughs> I mean, the range of what can happen with film is amazing. It is amazing. And you've been a star for 70 years. What do you think is the key to longevity as an actor? You got to have a lot of luck, Harvey. You got to have a lot of luck. I've had a lot of fortune with that. I've had a lot of good people handling my my career. And I've, I've just been, it's just, it's been wonderful for me. It's something that I've, I wanted to do. I wanted to be an actor. I wanted to be in the film business. Look at how lucky I am. You know, that I'm blessed. I'm blessed, believe me. And do you really, do you think that you really get how beloved and talented and gifted you are? That's a wonderful thing for you to say. <laughs> well, because it's not just luck. It's not just luck. It's also got to be talent and charisma and likability. And you, sir, have that in spades. Oh, thanks so much, Harvey. You're, you're making my, my life here. This is wonderful. You can say all of it, you know? Well, I also want to mention, besides your autobiography, Pieces of My Heart, you wrote two other really fabulous books. You must remember this, which is about the people and places of the golden age of Hollywood. And I loved her in the movies about the great female movie stars you've known and worked with. These books have done so much to preserve the memory and the legacy of classic Hollywood. What inspired you to write those books? Well, the people. I mean, with all of the women that, that I worked with. By the way, you know who's on that cover? It's, it's always a, an interesting thing to ask people. And they look at it and they say, who is that? It's Lana Turner. The main, you probably knew that, but, <laughs> you know, you being a film buff, but a lot of people don't realize that. There, there were just, just such wonderful ladies and, you know, they were all so great to me. And I, I was just thrilled to be able to be on the, with them and be with them and and they were all wonderful to me and on uh, you must remember this uh, we may be making a, 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 a TV documentary out of that it may go into that oh, wow that would be amazing yeah well RJ you've always said that the mark of a gentleman is how he treats people he doesn't have to be nice to I have to tell you that spending this time with you, sir, has truly been a highlight of my life because you are such a gentleman and such a great talent. Thank you so much for giving me this interview. Well, I want to tell you, it's, this has been one of the highlights of my career. I've had a wonderful interview with you. As a matter of fact, I would say it's the best. Thank you so much. You've been so so gracious to me and, and so... Uh, so wonderful to my career and my family. And I can't tell you how much I appreciate it, Harvey. You well, remember. RJ, I want to thank you for your body of work, for your books, especially for spending this time with me and our viewers. I hope you know I'm immensely grateful. I'll always remember this very, very special conversation. Thank you so much. Maybe we'll do it again. Anytime. <laughs> Love it. Our guest has been the legendary Robert Wagner. Be sure to visit Mr. Wagner's website, robert-wagner.com, for all the information you need about this iconic actor and author. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.